bother with my last name. People do generally struggle with it. <laughs> so, um, so today we are um, on a panel today, and uh, I thought that um, it's a nice, cozy uh, environment. I thought perhaps we'd keep it a little bit casual. Uh, if anybody would like to um, question or ask anything during the middle of the panel, um, where I think we'd be happy to take the questions. So we'll just start it off. I'd like the, the, the concept of today would be a little bit of covering a little bit of the past, the present, and the future. So um, I think all of us come from a provenance of uh, big banks or financial institutions or, or consulting companies. And uh, very much like uh, how we grew up with our parents, you know, there is this level of separation or independence from our parents. So the real question is how do we deal with, um, how do we deal with our past and how do we deal with the old, with the old guard? So um, what is the relationship that we have? Are we, the, are we the child that runs away and never sees their parents again or is it living in the garage or you know, visiting every once a year and keeping their parents in an old age home? Let's, uh, let's, let's put it up there. Kevin, would you like to start? Sure. A uh, quick introduction of myself. Um, so we are, I'm the co-founder of Finance Society's Model Cool. We are the biggest SME digital financing platform in Southeast Asia, currently licensed and operating in Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia. So we have started at around 2015, and we've given out about half a billion dollars in loans to date, um, averaging about $50, 50 million dollars every single month. Loss at about 0.89 or 0.9 percent in the first to date cumulatively, um, and we are backed by Sequoia and SoftBank, Cap SoftBank Capital. Um, I think in terms of how we think about uh, our, our position versus the traditional banks and whatnot. We really see ourselves as complement. I find that when the first generation of fintech players or peer-to-peer -peer lenders came up, um, everyone talks about democratizing, everyone talks about disruption, but we generally see that from an industry structure perspective, I think peer-to-peer -peer lenders or SME digital, digital financing players are well positioned to really serve short, small, unsecured term loans that have higher interest rates vis-a-vis -vis what the traditional banks are perhaps much better in doing, which is big, long, secured loans at lower interest rates. So really, as, as, form of compliment, uh, as a compliment instead of the string competition, right? And from a working relationship perspective, we, have, we were the first player that have started a partnership with a bank, uh, with DBS Bank in 2016, and have continuously been working with banks at each of the countries. And I find that um, there is a natural symbiotic relationship with, with financial institutions to the extent that the banks are willing. And oftentimes the whole conversations can be quite, um, can be quite uh, subject to the actual management team that you're working with. So, so to that extent, hopefully we can work more and to, to jointly drive uh, and serve the SMEs that have been traditionally underserved for quite some time. Thank you, Ajit. Hi, my name is Ajit Raikar. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Validis Capital. Um, we are friends and competitors of Kelvin next door. Uh, I'm a banker by training, spent almost 30 years in banking, 20 of those with uh, Citibank uh, across the world, you know, giving SME loans in different parts of the world, and the last nine years with Tamasek uh, slash DBS. Uh, we are a platform like, uh, like uh, Kelvin's uh, funding societies. We were set up about three years ago. Till date, we have given about $250 million of loans entirely in Singapore. We went live with our Indonesia business on Monday. So we will give uh, Kelvin and his team a, a run for his money, I promise you, in the next couple of months. And we will go to Vietnam in the next uh, four to five months. We are a Temasek slash Vertex Ventures owned company. And uh, we also have a significant uh, shareholding with uh, a Dutch financial institution called FMO. Um, we again, I think I have a similar view like Kelvin. We believe we are not competitors to banks. And in fact, our business is very complementary to a bank. And we also have a, a partnership for the last couple of years with a large global bank present in 125 countries, whom unfortunately I can't name, uh, and are having discussions with several other banks. Because I think from our perspective and the bank's perspective, we truly believe that together we can, we can meet the huge unmet need for SMEs in our region which runs to you know, a staggering $750 billion just in ASEAN. And uh, I think us and um, Kelvin and, and you know, platforms like us play a really meaningful role in, in helping uh, SMEs get what we call simple, fast and flexible financing solutions to help them grow their business and take it from where they are to where they want to be, which are hopefully public listed companies over the next 10, 20 years. Hi everyone, I'm Poon Ping. Um, um, the Asian Banker uh, is a uh, strategic research and intelligence organization uh, that have been covering um, financial services uh, starting in Asia. We are based in Singapore, 
we are privately owned, so no association with the other you know, publication that's called you know, Banker. Um, uh, before joining the Asian Banker uh, seven years ago, uh, I was from the banking industry. Um, um, it seems that uh, DBS is a common trend. Uh, I, I spent 10 years in DBS and a few years in UOB before uh, taking this role to you know, track some of the developments um, and also the transformation of the financial uh, industry uh, post global financial crisis. So we've been tracking a lot of the innovation that's happening, a lot of the digital transformation. Uh, since uh, five years ago, we started to introduce program like Future Bank Innovation Tours, looking at some of the innovation that's coming through from fintechs, um, as well as uh, our uh, signature uh, summit event, which we rebranded a couple of years ago uh, now to call the Future of Finance uh, Summit. Um, now, we've observed a, a few uh, characteristics of uh, some of the uh, transformation and uh, disruption that's happening. And it involves four, four battles, right? Um, banks traditionally are very focused on products and transactions, uh, very focused on compliance. Banking and financial services is a regulated uh, industry. Banks have got the regulatory mandate to serve customers, uh, but they don't necessarily have the customer mandate. Uh, and post-financial crisis, we see that a lot of the things that the banks aren't doing very well uh, started to be disrupted. And the disruption revolved around four areas. Uh, the disruption, the better in onboarding today, you know, banks aren't the best in onboarding. If you talk to SME customers, it takes week, it takes huge amount of documentation in order to start a relationship. Um, onboarding, uh, KYC uh, requirement and so on and so forth. Uh, the better around digitizing product and services. There is a whole lot of costs uh, that banks carry today uh, in order to serve uh, customers better. There's a lot that they have to give up, right? Uh, a lot of the cost base that they have to give up. Uh, there is a better place in uh, payments, uh, which the earlier speaker talked about, which we won't uh, go into. Um, and the fourth area is in the uh, area of building communities, uh, ecosystem. Banks traditionally aren't very good at coming together and building something that everyone can share. Uh, even with the association that they have uh, brought together, uh, there are still friction that you know, is not the most uh, cost efficient um, and that's why it gives rise to aggregator, right? That gives uh, better uh, efficiency and, and better cost savings. Um, and what we are seeing is everyone, either uh, earlier speaker talk about uh, regulation is behind technology, and that's true. Um, and in this space, everyone wants to be either a financial technology that enables without being regulated, right? And they want to be a platform to build ecosystem to meet the needs of uh, customers. Thank you, Boonping. So I guess, um, I, please go ahead. Can there be a question? I think, I think, uh, question to Ajit, actually, and perhaps the question of, uh, but firstly, I'd like to understand, did I understand correctly, that you are a platform to provide services to these banks that have invested in and get funded for No, no. I think, uh, Kelvin and me both provide uh, solutions to SMEs uh, by connecting them with, um, with accredited investors or with investors on our platform using a technology backbone, backbone to support loans to these SMEs. So it's the other way around. Correct. So these banks that have invested are you exclusively applied to? Okay. Uh, just to clarify, uh, we don't have a bank that has invested in us. Our investors are Temasek slash FMO. But we have a partnership with, um, with Citibank, in our case, Citibank, where we, together with Citibank, provide financing solutions or loans in simple terms to their SME customers that they are not in a position to provide or don't want to provide for whatever reason. And therefore, together, we provide a solution, a financing solution to their SME customer. That's our partnership with the bank. The balance sheet is ours. It's completely off their balance sheet. Yes, absolutely. 
So I think it also depends because we do partner with at least one, if not two banks. So we are non-exclusive to any banks um, in, in Southeast Asia. Neither do we take any money from banks. I think it, the partnership nature really depends on, on financial institutions. For example, in the case of our partnership with UOB Bank in Malaysia or RHB Bank in Singapore, it's a pure referral model, very much like what IG has said. But in the case of Indonesia, we do partner with a bank whereby for them to hit a certain percentage of, say, uh, loan outstanding in the SME space, they actually land through our platform, so using us as an origination channel. So it really depends on a bank-by-bank -bank, uh, basis. Thank you. All right, so the next subject is um, how we are handling things today. So technology and innovation are great things, but they don't necessarily apply to everything. So, uh, for example, we want the most advanced phone in our pocket, but we do not necessarily want the most advanced chair to sit on. Um, if the thing is not broken, in many cases, there's no need to fix it. So, um, so my company is in wealth management, and what one of the hardest, one of the more difficult uh, things that we had to deal with was the fact that a lot of investors don't necessarily want the most complicated investment products. And so for us to be smarter than everybody else actually meant us to be dumber than everybody else and try to offer the most stable and safe solutions out there. So I think every industry does does have its vagaries, and I think that there are there are um, so there are no chairs and manufacturers over here. So um, let, me, let me turn it to the panel and let me ask, um, how, have you, um, how have you implemented technology and modernization in your business uh, today? So I think fundamentally for, for SMEs, um, given that they have been, fairly, have been underserved by the ex existing or traditional financial institutions for quite some time, for us the two key value propositions that we're solving um, is actually not cost. We are never going to be cheaper by banks, primarily because our source of funds are not 0.5%, right? Our source of funds are investors or, play, or providers of funds to us typically treat us as an investment product and therefore the cost of funds typically are at least 7% and above. Um, so our key value proposition is really in the form of access and speed access and speed and that's where we apply technology to to really deliver that right and that so in terms of access wise we are actually a large part of our customers actually have not gotten a bank line off from a financial institutions at all and the bank loan that we have given them is the very first loan they have ever received in the history of the whole company that have set up in and really the goal is to enable more and more companies that previously may not have had a chance to get um uh, uh, an official bank loan to actually have a chance to actually take one so as to grow their business. And our, we, our, we are really here to re replace um, money lenders and all credit cards instead of saying necessarily like displacing banks because these are customers that have never been served before. And the idea is that at some point when these companies grow bigger, when they need bigger amount of funds, when they need lower cost of capital, um, we will be able to work with a bank and actually refer them across because for our model, it's going to be very hard for us to crowdfund, say, a loan that is $5 million. It's just not, not possible to crowdfund within a few hours' time. So really using technology to, to be able to, to help us to better identify and access the risk of these SMEs and hopefully provide them a, a form of financing that um, has a high repayment rate so that we can continuously attract investors to fund these customers. So really a problem of access. And number two is really a, par a, problem, a problem of speed and experience, right? So on average, we've done, we've conducted research that um, financial institutions in Southeast Asia typically takes about 30 to 40 business days. Actually, sorry, yeah, 30 to 40 uh, days to provide loans, and on average, we, we can, are able to do it at least at one third, at, at long, we can go, give them a loan as fast as one third of a pace, sometimes even faster within the same day. So how can we, and that is oftentimes through a fairly seamless process whereby we integrate with MyInfo, with other official public as well as private sources of information so that we can actually underwrite, the, underwrite their loans and really evaluate their loans in a pretty seamless way so that from an experience perspective, SME owners who are very busy with their work do not have to spend a lot of time um, to actually apply for a loan to get that financing. So really where we have applied technology is really in the form of uh, providing access as well as speed and, and experience towards SMEs in terms of giving them unsecured term loans. Thank you. Okay. Ajit? Hi. Um, our value proposition is uh, similar and in a sense different from Kelvin. Our value proposition is also to provide loans to SMEs in a simple and fast manner using technology as our differentiator to be able to, and in our process we can do a KYC, do a uh, risk assessment, and pay the money out to the customer within 48 hours for a new to bank customer. And for an existing customer, it's on the same day. That compares with, you know, bank stake. Having worked in a bank, I know it because I've given loans to SMEs all my life. If you're lucky and you really, the guy really likes you, 21 days. So we cut that, 
cut short that time from 21 days to less than 24 hours for a new to bank customer. And the way we can do it is obviously using technology. So we have an algorithm, a proprietary algorithm that we have built, um, risk uh, algorithm that we have built in a partnership with the a Credit Research Initiative uh, Institute of the NUS. And we've also built a proprietary fraud algorithm in, in Validus because fraud is a very important part of lending to an SME and fraud is high. And through these algorithms using technology and a very safe, secure, uh, cloud-based platform, we are able to offer a solution to an SME within, within 24 hours at prices, and therefore I think that's where some of, our, some of the platforms differ in their strategy, at prices that are bank-like prices. So they are nowhere close to money lending prices, on our platform at least, because the, the, we have chosen the path of originating uh, accredited investors as our investors on the platform only. We don't have any retail investors and therefore their risk expectations are understood, but their return expectations are also a lot more muted than if we had complete retail investors on the platform, which indirectly enables us to transfer that lower return expectations to the SMEs and therefore allows us as validators to price SME loans marginally higher than a bank loan, uh, keeping in mind that these loans are completely unsecured uh, with zero collateral attached to them. And as you probably know, just the amount of financing uh, unmet needs, even in a country like Singapore where you would think the need is small, there's almost a 20 billion unmet SME financing gap in Singapore. You throw in a country like Indonesia where the gap could be easily 150 billion US dollars. And therefore the opportunity for platforms like us to support SMEs in, with growth capital at prices that are not money lending like and deliver to them fast and, uh, and in an easy manner, I think is just enormous. And we try and play a small role uh, in that development of SMEs and we have estimated if from our perspective, for the loans that we have given, and we've given close to $250 million only in Singapore since we started, we have touched close to 300,000 people directly or indirectly in Singapore. And we feel you know, proud to be part of that, uh, of that growth for supporting SMEs uh, uh, in their growth aspirations. Would you like to add something, Punpi? Oh. Oh, sorry. oh, yeah, please go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mit, um, as Kevin and um, uh, Ajit has uh, mentioned, um, technology is essential part to delivering uh, more seamless uh, customer experience today. Uh, and it's all about being able to turn around the processes very quickly. And today, you, you can't do it with manual processes. And a lot of the technology go into digitizing and automating processes, right? From uh, KYC, you know, identifying people through bio biometrics, whether it's facial recognition or, you know, thumb vein or various other uh, type of technology to removing paper, the use of OCR to recognize document, uh, aut automating the process um, and automating traditional credit risk assessment processes through uh, the use of AI, machine learning uh, that cut down, uh, turn around, but also improve uh, the whole process in terms of accuracy, in terms of efficiency. So uh, technology is, is really very key to uh, the delivery of modern financial services. You can't do without it. Would you like to have a question? Uh, sure. Uh, from, from our platform's perspective, our average ticket size, so which means loan size is $70,000, SING dollars. And our average customer exposure or customer limit is close to 200,000 SING dollars. That's from our platform perspective. We have been uh, in business uh, for the last three years. So we gave our first loan in February 2017. <clears throat> And uh, like I said, we are just in the process of going live. Oh, we went live in Indonesia last last Monday. Uh, you had a third data. question? Yeah, data. I think you're right. I think 
you know our ability at uh, improving our turnaround times and using ai and machine learning etc uh, effectively depends a lot on the amount of data i have if i have no data all that is academic for me i can you know talk about ai and machine learning but if i don't have data and uh, uh, then it's just academic but i think over the last 3 years and our strategy as as a business has been um, as a company has been partnerships you know we believe that's one of our differentiators so a lot of our customer origination that we do for our sme customers comes through some partners the partners could be large corporates the partners could be a partnership with like a city bank we have a we are the only p2p platform in uh, in the region that has a partnership with visa so a lot of these partnerships because of the value they see by uh, in, in associating with us share a lot of data and information for the mutual benefit of our customer and i think as we get more and more uh, data and uh, through these various partnerships because we originate less than 30% of our customers uh, are onboarded through one on one connections 70 to 80% come through partners so we have a partnership with a very large number of large uh, singaporean entities whose entire ecosystem we are a part of and we have plugged into their ecosystem thanks to the partnership which obviously gives us the ability to acquire customers in thousands potentially through these partnerships what this does for us is one it starts moving us and evolving our uh, risk algo away from a heavy dependence on financials which is how we started because we had no information to using surrogates and other data to be able to uh, come to decisions using much more sophisticated risk algos compared to where we started 3 years ago i mean if i look back at our risk algo 3 years ago it was an algo that looked just like a bank's underwriting model exactly the same because we had no data we had a great vision we had a concept we had a deck and but no data today if i look at our same risk algo that i spoke about which we can turn around uh, customer approvals in 24 hours relies probably a very small percentage weightage for financials because over the last 3 years we have built data which allows us to use surrogates which allows us to use past performance which allows us to use so many other data points separate from financials and therefore has allowed us to migrate from being a single product company to providing the entire gamut of products that an SME wants so today we can provide you can provide you a straight loan we can provide you an invoice financing we can provide you a a uh, a uh, a uh, uh, a little you know, pre uh, contract financing for a contract that you've just got or we can provide you a loan to 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 support your 3 uh, year project that you may have and that's only because we've built data over the last couple of years and i think as we go along this route over the next 3 4 5 years we will be able to provide uh, financing much faster i mean today i i say we do it in 24 hours but clearly our ambition and vision is that can i deliver a loan of this size so we're not talking of a loan of 5000 dollars or 10000 you know my average ticket size for a customer is 200000 can we deliver them deliver a solution to them in 2 hours i think we can we moved away from 48 to 24 and i think over the next 2 3 years we will be in a position to turn around and really from our perspective is just give the customer such a great experience that he starts thinking of us as his first partner and first port of call whenever he has a financing need and today we are in a position where we proudly say that we have a 90% customer retention rate 90% of our customers come back to us for more and more loans and that's something that makes us feel good but that's largely driven because we give the customer such a great experience in terms of simplicity in simplicity speed and really meeting the needs that he wants when he wants uh, and not having him to wait for you know forever to get a loan just a point on on data right so today um a lot the fintech use proxy use um non traditional data sources and uh, if you look at uh, one of the traditional you know, banks their data is a lot on financials um and they they don't have really big data or smart data right they have static data uh, that doesn't allow some of this uh, algo to work uh, there's concerns about data privacy and data ownership but some of a survey uh, uh, done by Accenture in Hong Kong and in China uh, consumers here in the space of consumer consumers are more willing to share data for better financial services right if in exchange for better service better turn around i get my loan approved uh, and so on and so forth uh, they are willing to give up that data uh, fintechs and platforms are very good at getting data um uh, today our mobile phone is a sensor 
right? A lot of the platform are sensors uh, that allow us to, to gather data. Traditional players um, are falling behind in terms of defining that data, collecting that data, and, and using that data. So, so um, innovation in the use of data, especially in machine learning, where uh, it, it is self-learning, it improves uh, your uh, risk or credit assessment uh, outcome um, will you know, increase uh, the service provided to consumers. Perhaps to, uh, I'll not repeat what, what has been sh uh, shared, but perhaps just add two points. I think the first one is that um, I think the matter of data is actually quite sensitive in the sense that even in the case of Indonesia where a lot of fintech players start claiming that hey, can, I can provide better service through alternative data, the abuse of it has actually led to the shutdown of all mobile ex data of mo on, in, in the form of mobile, right? So last time, it, mobile footprint used to be the key lifeline of a lot of consumer financing players in terms of providing, uh, in terms of doing credit underwriting. Um, now, that all access has been stopped. Um, and even before access has been stopped, um, most of the information can only get it from Android phones, and Android phones have shut it down. Most of the information can get from social media, but because of the of privacy issues in, in US, that has also been cut off. So a reliance on certain, da certain data source can provide cert um, certain level of risk in terms of over-dependencies. That's one. But also, on top of that, we also realize that a lot of this non-traditional information may or may not be that useful from an SME financing perspective. So it's really complementary of how can we piece different p types of information together. So today, we have accumulated about 900 gigabytes of information, which we are, in which we are growing at about 4% every single month, cutting across various forms of data sources, which we are piecing it together. Hence, that what allow that allows us to do is that currently, in terms of product lines, we have pursued a multi-prone multi product, starting from um, micro loans to uh, entire chain of trade financing, supply chain distributor, POs, and so forth, all the way to unsecured term loans. In the lowest of end, which is approximately five hundred to a thousand dollars per per ticket size, which is perhaps ten of about few weeks, we process about two thousand loans every single day. Um, so. Uh, uh, averaging about 60,000, uh, reaching 100,000 uh, uh, of loans every single day on that small ticket sizes. And then on the bigger ticket sizes, we have a pro the average size is about 70,000 to 100,000 USD. Um, we, are, we are processing in the hundreds. So it's not just about providing access and underwriting better, but also managing it at scale. Because if we are to become moved from alternative financing to mainstream, we will be able need to be able to manage a scale like that, not just from a data perspective, but also from overall corporate governance and risk management. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the four of us are sitting up at this panel. I guess that, that that's an attestment to the fact that we've survived thus far, right? So, uh, and, uh, and now what we're looking is we're looking t uh, towards the future. And so there, there comes with the future and what we do not know tomorrow, there comes with us, there comes with a certain element of fear. So uh, it's said that we will have the first computer that is going to be smarter than a human being in under 10 years, five to 10 years. The first computer that's smarter than all human beings in under 20 years. That is the singularity, you know, go watch Terminator, it's a great movie. Um, so there's, that's one possibility of what's out there. But um, there are several things out there that are new and we haven't, put our, we haven't wrapped our heads around it, whether it's AI, whether it's machine learning, whether it's blockchain. So uh, Bunping, perhaps you'd like to start. What do you think is our biggest challenge and uh, slash opportunity with what, is, what we see on the horizon right now in terms of technology? I, I, oh. I think in terms of technology, um, a lot of the financial technology and platform players are uh, pretty advanced in their use of um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and also in terms of knowing the, the sort of data uh, from the consumer. Uh, uh, there's great opportunity from the traditional industry uh, where they need to catch up on is really in this area of data. Um, you know the, the the use of big data and, and so on and so forth. So I think fundamentally uh, there are fu fundamental issues to be fixed. Um, and the other area is is in terms of collaboration, where there is meaningful collaboration uh, in the ecosystem between fintechs, big techs, platform uh, is where uh, you have that conversion of the use of uh, this data. Ajit? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, the reality today is even though we call ourselves fintechs, even in a country like Singapore, the reality is we are a tech plus touch business. And that's real. That's real. You know, even today, while we would love to 
to to connect with the bank seamlessly and therefore offer customers a much better experience the reality is we can't do it even in a country like singapore for various reasons let's not get into why but it's it's a fact we cannot go and pull data with even with customer consent from a bank i cannot pull data on your credit bureau score from the cvs even if you give consent directly and therefore you know while we talk of being fintechs even in singapore and you know other countries are a little behind i think there's a lot of stuff uh, that needs to be done going forward in just connecting the truly connecting the ecosystem that exists even in a country like singapore or, or indonesia or wherever else to be able to give customers solutions that they want in a much faster and easier manner i think the you know without you know yes blockchain will happen and you know yes and all the all the good sexy stuff will happen but i think just connecting platforms like us who are truly trying to find solutions for customers and helping them grow and connecting them to the ecosystem whether it's through the through government agencies or banks or credit bureaus and financial institutions and connecting all of us to be able to write sensible uh, uh, algorithms and sensible solutions to customers going forward i think will be a big leap forward for us from our perspective just for even for the next 2 to 3 years even before we start one you know trying to figure out how to change the world and you know making you know a, a, a robo give a loan to an sme even if we start talking about finding a simple solution where all of us are seamlessly connected through apis with the banking system with the central bank with credit bureaus with uh, with credit rating agencies and uh, and another ecosystem that exists i think it itself will be a big leap forward in terms of giving that that sme customer who wants to grow uh, 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 an easy fast simple solution at prices which will suddenly start becoming extremely remunerative for them because once you have an efficient ecosystem that also connects investors you know like your customers um, uh, from the well side and giving them access to this alternate uh, investment class which which performs as is expected from a risk and reward perspective you're suddenly opening up a whole pandora's box of solutions for the smes both from a lending perspective as much from an investor perspective giving him uh, access to 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 products that don't exist for him or he doesn't even know about <laughs> what is your biggest opportunity slash fear um, in terms of technology, or the opportunity that it, that's, uh, that you would um, look at going forward? So it can either be something that you embrace, or something that you fear, or both. I think from uh, ourselves and industry, if I start with just ourselves, like what I should have rightfully pointed out, the truth is that the key limiting factor is not technology. The key limiting factor is really market maturity and regulations. That. Currently, even when we are looking at, say, trying to drive a seamless digital, 100% digital process, it's actually really hard because some connections just cannot happen by virtue of regulations, or some connections just cannot happen by virtue of incumbent lobbying. So it's oftentimes digital, offline, digital again, or digital, digital, offline, offline, digital again. So it's not a full seamless process. Um, and this is something that I, I think oh, that I, I do think that there's a certain level of irrational fear that's that's uh, that present that's present resulting in such a situation. But I do think that one day where open banking will come and allows really full access in terms of data connections, and that to us I believe is it will be for the betterment of everything. But if I think from a bank's perspective, um, so previously I was working with Essential, uh, McKinsey, and subsequently subsequently KKR, and I, so I was not from a bank before. But if I just put myself into, a sho into their shoes through some of the clients. That have advice in in terms of bank transformation, I think that's the fear towards fintech. Actually, is sometimes in all kind I find it's a bit misplaced because the true competitors, if you think about it, the biggest threat is not players like us. It's players like Alibaba and Grab Financial. If you think about it, and if anything, and and the truth is that. Um, if and if we do play a part in this in this whole ecosystem, a larger part of it is really expanding the pie and potentially complementing, uh, complementing the existing financial institutions to work in tandem with the other tech giants or tech fin giants, who, which may be from Southeast Asia or may not be from Southeast Asia, and why this we. This presents likely the most, the best shot for financial institutions is that there are really three key options for them to, for for financial institutions to respond. Right, either you make, you buy, or you partner. If any platform is any digital financing company is worth their salt, they're not, not going to sell to you. The only reason they will sell to you is because they've maximized the value that they can get out of that venture, and therefore they sell it to you. So if they are willing to sell it to you, probably it's not worth buying it anyway. If and if you can't buy it, you can you try to make it. But the truth is that from a total traditional, from a business model, from a team building, from a culture, from organization limitations, from a just um, 
corporate finance perspective, it's just not going to be really hard for any banks to be willing to take losses consecutively for, for a sustained period of time before hitting profitability and invest and build, build something by themselves. Perhaps with the exception of Goldman Sachs where they have enough margins to make that kind of uh, losses in a short period of, or short to medium term, right? So, so ma making themselves may not be the best option. So the, literally the last option available is really partnering. And I think that in the, last few, uh, in the first few years of, uh, of the advent of financial technology in Southeast Asia, uh, in, in all fairness, there isn't that much reason to partner because most of us uh, fintech players have not built much capabilities to offer to financial institutions. But I think that having come through the last three, four, five years or so, uh, certain level of competencies have been built that in all candor is quite a bit advanced compared to what the financial, financial institutions may have. So I do think that the synergies of working together becomes a lot more valid and adding on the whole macro trends that open banking is bound to, to, to come at some point in time. Um, I think that um, there is any banks that are, or financial institutions that are willing to listen or willing to garner enough um, organizational momentum or conviction, I think that is a huge opportunity um, to, to work together. All right, last question of the day. So uh, we've been talking about fintech, we've been talking about technology. So Crossbridge also has a robo-advisory platform and, uh, and my phone tells me what to do. So it's, uh, it's, we're getting to the point now that we are pushing forward and, and machines and, and um, technology is starting to become much more prevalent in our lives. So the question really will be, do we integrate it in physically to us? Um, how do we interact with, uh, with technology? And where, what, what remains as the part as, uh, as us, as human beings? What is the human element to this all? I mean, is there something more than just being batteries for the machine? You know, is there, is there something else for us? So um, maybe, Kelvin, would you like to start? How do, you, how do you think that the human element will retain in your business? I think that from, uh, for SME financing, I do think that a human element will be here to stay for quite some time, primarily because at the end of the day, why SME financing has been fundamentally underserved uh, for the longest period is because there is a certain level of uniqueness in each of the SMEs that, are, that, we, that, that we serve. So if we just take a step back, consumer SMEs corporates, why the cons consumers can serve by having a ho relatively homogeneous, relatively simple product because the needs for the retail, invest retail uh, consumers are fairly homogeneous. And to the extent that it's homogeneous, you can actually use technology and data to solve it at scale. Why is it that corporate banking is very, or even investment banking is very hard for you to, to use big data to solve it? Because ultimately, relationship, posturing in negotiations, um, advice, personal advice, the, it, it is each of the cases of a corporate, of, of a, of a corporate company or if, it's very, very different. And, it's actually, and give, to the extent that it's different, it makes it really hard for you to just use a simple algorithm or even machine learning to just address it. Um, so SME is kind of faced in a force in middle whereby it's not that homogeneous, but it's not that big in ticket size for you to have a, have a full team of sales force or expensive corporate bankers to really serve you on a case-by-case -case basis. So therefore, I think that SMEs financing actually was for somewhere in between whereby there will be increasing amount of automation or actually hum or machine learning guidance to aid decisions from towards humans, but I don't, necessarily, I don't think that it will fundamentally replace humans uh, in terms of decision making or even serving. Thank you, Kelvin. Ajit? Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, Kelvin on that. You know, an SME is neither fish nor fowl. You know, they're neither small tickets, standardized, uh, completely robo-advised uh, small ticket deals, nor are they large corporates like a Singtel that need a bespoke solution every time. And therefore, I think the, the element of people and experience and, you know, bad loans on your back being transferred into algos uh, as a learning, I think will 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 be there for some time to come. I don't think it's going to disappear uh, uh, in a hurry. I mean, banking and financial services is uh, still a trusted service, so trust is a very important element. Um, and humans tend to trust human, so uh, having human relationship managers, uh, product managers, you know, are are very important. Um, and machines can only do so much. Uh, there's an important role for humans in terms of doing the coding, doing the programming. A lot of the technology deals with historical data, right? You don't know how the business will evolve. It's the human imagination that can ideate and think of you know, innovation going forward. So you still need, need a human there, but a very different type of human, you know, much enhanced, much uh, augmented by technology. All right, thank you. It's already impacting. I think that it's already impacting. Yes. That's why there's only four of us instead of 30 of us on stage. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I was curious, especially with Kelvin and, uh, and uh, the gentleman, the impact and the ability to leverage the difference in cost of funds. You said you pay about your cost of funds is about seven percent. I put money in America; it's less than one percent a year. You come in Switzerland, they charge me money. Uh, what is the opportunity to leverage this source of funds through hybrid crop funding or? micro syndication and working with the microfinance organization in getting them with some skin in the game to lower the cost of financing for an emerging market. For lowering the cost of financing for emerging market, which you're doing to an extent, enabling the financing, but being able to take it to the next level by facilitating really the, the, the source of funds from a developed market, high risk, but mitigated by Human intervention by looking in the microfinancing, but enabling them by lowering the cost rather than having the, the cost of finance. So actually in all Canada, I think that has a huge opportunity for to us working with local and all foreign institutions, right? Because perhaps three, five years ago we don't need that. Primarily because at that point in time we were doing say a million dollars of of loans a month. So over the course of a year, $10 million or $15 million, like you raise it like this, easy, right? But if you're doing like $50 million a month, and in, by the end of this year, we're probably going to do around $100 million a month, it's going to be really hard for us to crowdfund that much of money, regardless from accredited investors or institutions and what, or, or individuals as, and whatnot. And therefore, I think it is, we are kind of at a crossroad whereby there's an obvious value that the financial institutions can provide and there's an obvious need that we will need to do it. And it's almost, it's almost like which bank is willing to blink first and that, then you will become a partner of choice. And the truth is that none of the platform can partner with too many banks because the f amount of effort to work with one bank is actually quite a bit hu it's quite humongous, right? And therefore, you ultimately want to work with two, three institutions as an anchor of it. Whether it's local and foreign institutions, it really depends because I do think that local institutions has, a, has the benefit of 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 uh, for of not having to charge additional forex costs, so USD to rupiah hedging is about five percent. So if you are a rupiah Indonesian bank, you don't have to pay that. But having said that, Europe and Japan do have a negative interest rates regime. So I think that depending on um, on situations, I think there's huge opportunity to work together. What about uh, what about meaning, uh, financial system, banking system uh, to provide some services for a non-human system? Uh, when uh, when humans can uh, start interact uh, start uh, business interaction with robots, what do you think? Is the bank system, its financial system, ready to provide uh, this specific service to robots? For example, uh, KYC for robots, uh, scoring for robots, uh, risk management for robots. It's not the sky fi I think, uh, because it's uh, today nowadays we see transformation around the world. What do you think about it? Have, have you some investigation in your company about this? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, you're asking if we would be servicing um, automated systems as opposed to people? I think we would still fall back towards the regular, the regular space, which is um, what is what is the legal title of the assets, what is the legal title of the company, what is the actual business, who's um, who's actually doing that. We would still fall back towards that until robots um, have uh, true true uh, until they pass a Turing test, become beings of their own right, and have legal uh, ability to own themselves. I think that we will still treat them as property um, up until that point in time. Um, so I think that it's more important. <laughs> in my view, for, to look at the ultimate um, holder of that business itself and look at that. In terms of how you would um, 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 look at the metrics, I think that could be done more efficiently because you just spit out the numbers from a financial statement in seconds as opposed to you know, days, right? So that would become more efficient. But that's a question of efficiency as opposed to uh, a change of the whole business model. That's what I would see at this point in time. Okay, thank you for that.